Hello everyone, today we'll talk about high yield concepts on stable angina. Stable angina pectoris refers to chest, neck, and arm discomfort or pressure that has been consistent for at least two months, triggered by physical or emotional stress, and alleviated by rest. Conversely, unstable angina represents a condition where chest pain is either newly onset, triggered by minimal exertion, occurs at rest, or has increased in frequency or severity. In patients without known history of coronary artery disease who present with symptoms suggestive of stable angina, the approach to diagnostic testing is guided by the pretest probability of obstructive CAD. If the patient has a low pretest probability of CAD, then there's no further testing. A low pretest probability is a patient with less than 15%. If the patient has intermediate or high pretest probability of CAD, then the next best option is either a stress testing or a coronary CTA. Stress testing is preferred in patients over 65 years old with a high suspicion of obstructive coronary artery disease. A coronary CTA is preferred in patients less than 65 years old with lower suspicion of obstructive coronary artery disease. If the patient is able to exercise, then choose an exercise stress testing, either an echo or spec or exercise EKG. If the patient is unable to exercise, choose a pharmacological stress testing, whether it's a CMR or with echo, PET, or SPECT. A 68-year-old man with history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia presents to his primary care physician complaining of chest pain on exertion that resolves with rest. He describes the pain as pressure-like sensation in the center of his chest, typically occurring during his daily walks and subsiding within minutes after stopping. He denies any pain at rest or nocturnal pain. His medications include atorvastatin and lisinopril. He has a known allergy to aspirin, which causes severe hives. His father had MI at the age of 70, and physical examination is unremarkable. An EKG shows no acute changes. His lipid panel is within normal limits. Which of the following is the most appropriate addition to the patient's treatment regimen? A low-dose aspirin, clopidogrel, prasugrel, or tacagrelor. The patient's presentation is consistent with stable angina, which is chest pain or discomfort typically elicited by exertion or stress and relieved by rest or nitroglycerin. This condition is a manifestation of coronary artery disease or CAD. Due to atherosclerotic plaques partially obstructing coronary arteries and limiting blood flow to the myocardium during increased demand situations. The mainstay of medical management for stable angina includes antiplatelet therapy to reduce the risk of thrombus formation which can lead to myocardial infarction. Aspirin is typically used as the first line antiplatelet therapy due to its antiplatelet effects which inhibits thromboxane A2 and subsequently prevent platelet aggregation. However, in patients with aspirin allergy, as in this case, an alternative antiplatelet therapy is needed. Clopidogrel irreversibly inhibits the P2Y12 component of ADP receptors on the surface of platelets, thus preventing platelet activation and aggregation. This makes clopidogrel an appropriate alternative for antithrombotic therapy in patients with stable angina who have a contraindication to aspirin. P2Y12 inhibitors include clopidogrel, prasugrel, and ticagrelor. P2Y12 is a receptor on platelets that binds to ADP and plays a role in platelet function, hemostasis, and thrombosis. However, in patients with stable angina, ticagrelor and prasugrel are not recommended. For stable angina, aspirin and clopidogrel are the only recommended antiplatelet therapy. If a patient with stable angina undergoes percutaneous coronary intervention, in short PCI, a dual antiplatelet therapy is continued for at least one month after a bare metal stent and at least six months after a drug eluded stent. If the patient with stable angina undergoes cabbage, dual antiplatelet therapy is recommended for 12 months to improve the patency of the vein grafts. A patient with stable angina should also be on a high-intensity statin. Reducing LDL cholesterol reduces the risk of vascular events and progression of CAD. If the LDL remains above 70, add exatamide. 
if the LDL remains above 70 while on statin and exenamide, consider adding PCSK9 inhibitor. Blood pressure control is also recommended with a goal of less than 130 over 80. If a patient with stable angina also has diabetes, chronic kidney disease, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction of less than 40%, or history of MI, consider an ACE inhibitor therapy or ARB, but not both. A 55-year-old man presents to the clinic complaining of chest pain or exertion. The pain has been occurring intermittently for the past few months, usually when he is walking his dog in the morning. The pain is described as pressure-like sensation in the center of his chest radiating to his left arm, lasting for about 10 minutes and relieved spontaneously with rest. He has a history of hypertension and dyslipidemia. He smokes about a pack daily and has a family history of CAD. His medications include lisinopril and high-intensity atorvastatin. Physical examination and resting EKG are both unremarkable. After further evaluation, he is diagnosed with stable angina. Which of the following is the most appropriate initial therapy to reduce the frequency of his anginal episodes? The correct answer here is metoprolol. This patient presents with typical angina symptoms, such as chest pain and exertion, relief with rest, which are indicative of stable angina. Beta blockers such as metoprolol is an anti anginal medication known to decrease myocardial oxygen, blood pressure, and myocardial contractility. By lowering the heart rate, beta blockers also increase diastole duration, which improves coronary blood flow and reduces ischemic episodes. Heart rate goal should be between 55 and 60 beats per minute while on beta blocker. But also keep in mind that beta blocker has no mortality benefit in stable ischemic heart disease. However, it does have mortality benefits in patients post MI or in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. If the patient still has continued chest pains while on beta blocker or the patient cannot tolerate beta blockers, consider calcium channel blockers. CCB causes coronary vasodilation and consequently improves myocardial oxygen delivery. Another option instead of a calcium channel blocker are nitrates. Nitrates causes coronary vasodilation, which then improves myocardial oxygen delivery. It also reduces preload, which then reduces oxygen demand. There are short-acting nitrates and long-acting nitrates. Short-acting nitrates are used for acute relief of chest pain, while long-acting nitrates such as acesorbide mononitrate or dinitrate provides constant vasodilation. Keep in mind that the most common side effects include flushing, hypotension, and headaches. Ranolazine, or brand name Renexa, can reduce angina and increase exercise time. It inhibits the late sodium current and prevent calcium overload. It should not be combined with medications with strong CYP3A4 inhibitors such as HIV medications and ketoconazole because it can increase ranolazine levels in the blood. Keep in mind that this medication has no heart rate or blood pressure effect. It is an appropriate option if the patient refuses invasive intervention and on maximal doses of anti-anginal medications and still has chest pains. Another medication to keep in mind for stable angina is called ivabradine. Ivabradine is a drug for symptomatic chronic stable angina with normal sinus rhythm and cannot tolerate taking any beta blockers. It is also a medication for patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction with an EF of less than 35% and the heart rate remains elevated despite being on beta blockers. Why is it important to control the heart rate in patients with heart failure and CAD? Well, heart rate is a diastolic interval. You want more time in the oscillate to allow more time to fill the heart and more time to perfuse the coronary arteries. It works on the sodium funny channels in the SA node. Patients experiencing angina that does not respond to medical treatment or those with significantly abnormal results from stress testing or coronary CT angiography should be evaluated for invasive coronary revascularization. The main objectives of revascularization in stable angina 
are to reduce angina symptoms and improve quality of life. A 55-year-old male with stable angina presents to the outpatient cardiology clinic for evaluation. He has been on optimal medical therapy, including aspirin, beta blocker, statin, and nitrate, with only partial relief of his symptoms. He has a history of hypertension and diabetes. He does not smoke. His exercise treadmill tests show decreased exercise tolerance and significant ST segment depression in multiple leads. Subsequent coronary angiography revealed three-vessel coronary artery disease with at least 70% stenosis in LAD, RCA, and left circumflex artery. The patient's LV ejection fraction is 60%. Which of the following is the most appropriate management for this patient? Increased dosage of current medications, PCI, cabbage, or continue current medical therapy and reassess in six months? The best answer is cabbage. This patient presents with stable angina that is not fully relieved by optimal medical therapy. The coronary angiography reveals significant three-vessel disease. In patients with stable ischemic heart disease, the decision between cabbage and PCI depends on the extent of the coronary artery disease, patient comorbidities, and other factors. In patients with stable angina who requires coronary revascularization, cabbage is preferred to PCI in patients with left main or three-vessel CAD or multi-vessel CAD with diabetes. Compared to PCI or medical management for chronic stable angina, cabbage is associated with reduced recurrence of chest pain, lower rates of MI, and lower rates of revascularization procedures. While PCI can provide relief from angina, it may be preferred in cases with less extensive disease or where cabbage poses a high surgical risk, cabbage is more beneficial in cases with extensive multivessel disease, especially in diabetic patients. Increasing the dosage of current medications is not appropriate given that the patient is already on optimal medical therapy and continues to have symptoms. Continuing current medical therapy without revascularization is not advisable due to the patient's significant disease and symptoms. Therefore, cabbage is the most appropriate management for this patient, given the extent of his coronary artery disease and his diabetes status. A 57-year-old male with a history of stable angina, hypertension, and type 2 diabetes presents to his cardiologist for a follow-up visit. He reports experiencing chest discomfort during his daily walks, which results with rest or nitroglycerin. His current medications include aspirin, metformin, beta blocker, and statin. His blood pressure today is 138 over 82, and his blood glucose level is well controlled. A recent exercise stress test showed ST segment depression. Subsequent coronary angiography reveals a single 70% stenosis in the proximal RCA. The LAD artery and the left circumflex artery are free of significant disease. The patient's LV ejection fraction is 60%. Given this patient's presentation and findings, what is the most appropriate next step in management? The correct answer in this case is a PCI. This patient has stable angina, evidenced by chest discomfort that occurs with exertion and improves with rest or nitroglycerin. His coronary angiography shows single vessel disease with a significant stenosis in the proximal RCA. In patients with stable angina and a single vessel CAD, especially when the symptoms are not adequately controlled by optimal medical therapy, PCI is often the preferred revascularization strategy. PCI is less invasive than cabbage and has a shorter recovery time making it suitable for patients with localized disease affecting only one coronary artery. This patient's diabetes does not automatically necessitate cabbage since the disease is not extensive, not affecting multiple major vessels. Although diabetes is a factor that can influence the choice between PCI and cabbage, in cases of single vessel disease, particularly when the disease is not involving the left main coronary artery or proximal LED, PCI remains a very reasonable approach. Cabbage is generally reserved for patients with more extensive 
coronary artery disease, such as those with significant left main disease, three vessel disease, especially if diabetic, or two vessel disease with significant involvement of proximal LAD or diabetes. Since this patient has a single disease without involvement of the LAD and his symptoms are not adequately controlled by medication, PCI is an appropriate management of choice. Increasing the dosage of current medications may be considered if the patient had not undergone diagnostic testing. But given the evidence of significant coronary stenosis and symptoms during exercise, revascularization is warranted. Initiation of calcium channel blockers can be an adjunctive treatment for symptom control, but does not address the underlying significant stenosis as directly as PCI. Therefore, the correct answer is PCI, as it directly addresses the patient's symptomatic single vessel CAD. PCI improves coronary blood flow by addressing the coronary obstruction, but is not proven to reduce mortality or risk for MI in patients with stable angina. A drug-eluting stent is preferred to a bare metal stent to prevent restenosis, acute stent thrombosis, and MI. Here are some rapid-fire key points. Stable ischemic heart disease refers to a patient with known coronary artery disease in at least six months from revascularization or an acute cardiac event. If the patient presents with a low pretest probability for obstructive coronary artery disease, further testing is not recommended. For patients with an intermediate to a high pretest probability for obstructive CAD, the next steps include either a stress test or a coronary CTA. The first line therapy for stable angina consists of aspirin statins, and beta blocker treatment. Antiplatelet therapy, including aspirin or clopidogrel, constitutes part of the medical management for stable angina. Dual antiplatelet therapy refers to a combination of aspirin and a P2Y12 inhibitor, such as clopidogrel, in stable angina. After PCI with a bare metal stent, patients should continue dual antiplatelet therapy for at least one month. Following a PCI with a drug-eluting stent, it is recommended to continue dual antiplatelet therapy for at least six months. Patients with stable angina undergoing cabbage should receive dual antiplatelet therapy for 12 months to enhance the patency of vein grafts. Patients should be on high-intensity statin therapy. If LDL cholesterol remains above the goal, add exenamide. Should the LDL levels continue to exceed the goal, consider adding a PCSK9 inhibitor. In stable angina, beta blockers do not provide mortality benefits, but serve as a good, effective anti-anginal medications. Maintain a heart rate between 55 and 60 beats per minute. If the patient cannot tolerate beta blockers, or if the heart rate remains above target while on beta blocker, consider using a bravidine. Should the patient continue to experience chest pain while on beta blocker therapy, consider adding either a calcium channel blocker or long-acting nitrate. If the patient is already on maximum dose of anti-anginal medications such as beta blockers, CCBs, and nitrates, consider either a revascularization or adding anolazine. Cabbage is warranted in patients with significant three-vessel CAD or two-vessel coronary artery disease with diabetes. Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed some high-yield key points on stable angina. Take care, and have a good day.